I'm glad to have Brother Bernie here. He was scheduled to be out of town, but he is here to worship the Lord with us. And uh, we're going to let Miss Sylvie come on up here and do some announcements. And then after that, we will uh, let the kids go ahead and do the penny march before we start everything. Yes. We want, we want the jingle jangle to, uh, to wake us up a little bit so we can uh, worship the Lord even louder. That sounds good? Oh. I don't know what happened with that microphone, but anyway. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to Congregational. It's awesome to have you here. Visitors, thank you for coming today. And uh, we have a welcome card in front of you with where the tithing envelopes are. If you would like to uh, please fill that out and put it in the tithing plate as it goes by. That way it's our way for us to, to connect with you. And now for the grand special announcement because she's going to the chapel and she's gonna get married. If you look in your bulletin, you will find a flyer because Tori West is changing her last name. Yes, she is, she's getting married. And it's congratulations, June 26th at four o'clock in the evening. Church, you are invited, please come. It's going to be an awesome day. We're watching our little girl who has been here since she was born. Since birth, she says, since birth. So we have to watch her go down the aisle. Congratulations, Tori. Today is Penny March, so get those jingle jangles of the coins going and the fluttering of the bills, because we're going to do that before we dismiss the kids. Yes, before we dismiss these guys. <laughs> so get that ready, guys. Women's Ministry Lunch, June 26th at Surf Rider. Come out and join the fun and some food. And don't forget about the Men and Women's Ministry Meeting, the 29th of June. We've got a lot to talk about, especially for Vacation Bible School, because I'm going to need a little bit of help, because Vacation Bible School is on July 10th. Need a little help in every, pretty much every part of the ministry for teaching. And Well, I've got the snacks covered, that's for sure. So thank you, Ellen, on that. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, don't forget about the prayer list in the back of our bulletin. Uh, very important to keep them in prayer as well as our nation. And we do have one more little surprise. It's Maddie's birthday today. She's four years old. Yeah. She hit the table yesterday. She's got a little shiner. Oh, but it's her birthday. It's your birthday, isn't it? How old will you be? Um, I am, I'm four. Four. That's big. Wow. Can we? Yeah. Big. And you're getting big. Yes, you are. Can we sing happy birthday to you? Okay. Let's sing happy birthday to our dear little Maddie. You want to do one? Okay. I'm in three. And you're three. You're going to have a birthday in a couple months too. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Maddie. Yes, and many more. Okay, let's praise the Lord. That's what we're here to do is praise our special speaker today. Before we do that, let's go ahead and do that penny march. Let's... let's. Amen. Father God, we thank you right now, Father God, for this time, Lord, of being being a part of you, Father God, being in the midst of you, Father God. We've raised, Father God, a hallelujah. We have raised up your name this morning, Father God. Lord, Lord, have your way in this house today, Father God. For it is because of you that we are here, Father God. It's because of you, Lord, we have breath. 
You give us every single breath, Father God. God, I just praise you right now, God, Lord, like I've never praised you before, Father God. Lord, I feel you here today. You have inhabited your, pray, your praises of your people, Father God. Lord, let us just be a part of your life, Father God. Lord, let you make the way for each and everything in our hearts, Father God. God, Lord, as we get ready to pray, Father God, even more for special people, Father God, as Brandon comes on up here, Father God. Lord, we just ask you right now, Lord, that you just touch, Lord, Pastor Ted Mercer's life, Father God, his family, Father God. Lord, as he has been, he has been brought into your arms, Father God. I know, Father God, that he is there with you, Father God. I know he is praising you, Father God. He has had the practice in church, Father God. He has had the practice at camp, Father God. He has had practice, Father God, sitting in his house, God, raising up his kids in the way that you have taught him, Father God. I know he is praising you right now. He is, he is sitting, Father God. He is kneeling, Father God. He is doing whatever you are telling him to do and shouting out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God, I thank you right now for that man's life and all the lives that he touched, Father God. Lord, from Chesapeake, Father God, all the way to Burgall. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for it all, Lord. We thank you for allowing him to be here at this church, Father God. Lord, and calling him here, Father God, for the time he was here. But God, right now, I just want to thank you for his daughter, Father God, and his wife, Father God. God, you've put a heart, Father God. A heart of gold in his children, Father God. Lord, I, I thank you for allowing me to meet them, Father God, and knowing what, who they are and what they stand for, Father God. Lord, I just pray right now, Father God, in agreement with his daughter, Father God, that you give her desire, Father. You give her her desire, Father. Lord, it's in thy blessed name, Father God. God, this morning, Lord, Lord, I'm asking you, I'm asking you, Father God, right now, Lord, that you touch Brother Mike. God, that you touch, you touch his kidneys, Father God. Lord, you touch, Father God, that, that body that you made, the temple that you made, Father God. God, and I thank you right now for a brother who would be willing to stand in the gap for him, Lord. Lord, Father God, and as I lay hands on Brandon, Father God, I pray, Father God, that you are laying hands on Mike, Father God. Lord, that you are touching Brother Mike Duckworth, Father God, and giving him complete healing, Father God. Complete healing, Father God. Lord, not from me, Father God, but from the power, Father God, in which you bestowed upon each one of us, Father God. The power that you gave Jesus, Father God. Lord, it is by Jesus' name, Father God, that I bind up every sickness in his body, Lord. I bind it up believing, Lord, and leaning on Matthew 18, 18, Father God. For you said whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And, Lord, I loose, Father God, right now, Lord, I loose every bit of healing that you have. For him, Father God. Lord, for I loose it, Father God, for you said if I loose it on heaven, it'll be loose loose in the earth loosed on heaven father god lord have your way father lord god i praise you right now god for it lord i praise you right now for that god lord father god i know that you are in control father god god i'm asking you to touch brother bernie father god and all the things on his heart right now father god it is with great pleasure father god that i agree with him father god Lord, I ask you to touch him, Lord, Sister Dreamer, Father God. Lord, touch them as they make decisions, Father God, for not just themselves, Father God, but for family, Lord. God, I just ask you, Lord, right now, Lord, that you know what else is going on in this church, Father God. You know the hearts of the people of this church. Lord, touch them, Father God. Touch the hearts. Heal them, Father God. Lord, I got, Lord, I just, right now, Father God, I am binding up the devil and all the crud that he is trying to do upon this church. I am binding him up and loosing you, Father God. I am loosing your power, your authority, Father God, to just go and make a way, Lord. Make the way, Father God, for us to be a part of, Father God, of everything that you have planned, Father. Lord, it is not by our powers, Lord. It is by yours and yours only, God. God, everybody on that prayer list, Father God, needs you right now. God, I ask you to touch Brother John and Sister Terry, Father God, as they're 
enjoying time with the grandkids, Father God, but give them safe travels back, Father. Father God, but most of all, out of all that being said, Lord, I'm just asking you right now, Lord, that there's not a day that goes by that your hand does not hit this church, Father God. Lord, let this be the beacon of light for so many people. Let this be the beacon of light of those who are walking in darkness and uncertainty, Lord. God, I praise you, Father God, for people who walk up to the church, Lord, and with a sincere heart, Father God, come for help from your people. God, I praise you right now, Lord, that we're able to help those people. This is a place of healing. This is a place in which those children, Father God, that might not call you a friend, quite yet, can come and find peace, can find joy, can find happiness, fullness, and love. God, your service today at Congregational PFWB Church is just that. It's yours. It's not ours. It's yours, Father God. Father God, let nothing ever be the same. Father God, let nothing ever be the same in our hearts, Lord, in our worship time, Father God. Lord, just let it be what you have and planned. Lord, Father God, I, I'm coming to you, Father God, with a heart, Father God, full of strife. Full of worry, Father God. Full of fear. Father God, I fear for this country. I fear, Father God, for the souls that are in the shadow of our steeple, Father God. Lord, I fear for the people who are in our contact list and our cell phones, Father God, that don't know who you are. God, and I pray that the fear be wiped away, Father. For where you stand, there is no fear. Where you dwell, Father God, you, there is no fear. And I stand as a follower of your son, Jesus Christ, with him in my heart, with your spirit dwelling with inside of me, Father God, I ask you to wipe away that fear, wipe away that worry. Father, it's, it, is, it is you, Father God, that, that lets me speak, lets me sing, lets me Dance, Father God, lets me wave my arms, Father. Let's me read your Bible, your word, Father God, your inspired word, Father God. God, what I'm asking you to do is just to let my flesh stop, Father God. Let my faith start over. Let my faith just lead on, Father God, because it's not by my power, it's by your power. Let this church, Father God, stop worrying about what he can do or she can do, Lord, and just let it worry about what you can do. Let it worry about what you can do. God, we're going to give you all the praise and the, all the honor and all the glory. For it is your and blessed and holy name that we do pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask um, our ushers to come forth as we get ready to give back to the Lord. It's the Lord.
the Lord God Almighty. Oh, praise, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. Ooh. This time we will go ahead and dismiss the kids. Go ahead and let them have some fun learning about Jesus. Praise you, Father God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for that right there, Father God. May we take heed to it, Father God. Live by your word, Father. Live by those things in which you have told us. Lord, we praise you, Father God. you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the pew or you can just look up on the screen. But this morning I want to bring you a message in which I felt like needed to be entitled, More Like Jesus. More Like Jesus. And it's probably a little bit different than what you would think. But what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about connections. Our lives are filled with connections. Matter of fact, in our Bible study, we've been looking at discipleship and connecting all the things that go along with discipleship. It's not just the fact of coming up beside someone, but there has to be a leadership part of it. There has to be a love about it. There has to be a knowledge about what to disciple somebody with, right? So there's connections in which we've been making on Wednesday nights, and I do encourage everybody to come on out to Wednesday nights. If you haven't been coming, I promise you, you can catch up. Right? But also, when we look at connections, we, we have to connect what Christianity is. It's a relationship with God that we can only get through His Son, Jesus Christ. And its only value is to give it away. Think about that. We're, we become Christians not, not to just help ourselves, but to help others. 
If you want to call yourself a true Christian, you need to make sure that the thing that God gave you, right, which is your salvation, you have to make sure that you tell other people that it wasn't just given to you, it was given to them too. It was given to the Muslim. It was given to, it was given to that person who decided to, to go into a college campus and shoot up all those people. It was still given for him. It was given to all those, it was given to the same thing all to those people who, who sit in Washington and say, well, a baby's not a baby until five minutes after it starts breathing. It was still given to them. There's a connection that we have to put out there. I mean, let's be honest. Connections are out there. Do you have a connection to your cell service? There's a bunch of towers, right? It gets us connected. There's this, this really big thing out there that somebody came up with. And within a few clicks, you can be connected to anything and everything out in the world. Good old World Wide Web. There's connections in our lives. But I feel like we have, we have stopped connecting to people out in the world. We're getting upset because somebody has a different skin color than we have. We're getting upset because they believe this way and we believe that way. I mean, we've even gotten so upset that the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist people get mad at the Free Will Baptist people that get mad at the Baptist people because we've lost connection. I mean, now y'all in here, y'all a little bit different. But back in Shine, North Carolina, if, you're, if the preacher's not wrapping it up at 1159, so they can be, because you know, at Shine, North Carolina, you got to drive 15 miles to go somewhere, I mean, 15 minutes to go eat somewhere on Sunday afternoon. If you ain't wrapping up at 1159, everybody's starting to walk out. I preached a sermon one time, no lie, I preached until 1230. Do you know when everybody stood up, they put their coats on? They lost connection while they were in church. Do you know how disheartening it is to stand on a stage, to stand behind a pulpit and see people put their coats on when you give them an altar call? It ain't just the outside that was cold. We've got to keep our connection. We've got to live out our connection into who we are. Think about this. Do you not have a connection with your husband, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend? Do you not have a connection with them? Yes. You had a connection if they were here. And when they were here, if, you, if they've passed and gone on, you still got a connection with them. You still connected to them. Sister Nana, I know you've been a special lady and you still got connections to every single person in this church, do you not? No. She's got connections to the other church. She's got connections to the denomination. She's got connections to my boss. But that's the thing. When we stop losing connection to people, and start putting things in the middle of people. I mean, let's make it, let's make it real recent. When COVID hit, the only connection you can make was on the World Wide Web. Okay? When COVID started getting a little bit lenient, and, they started, and people started saying, oh, you can put 50% capacity inside of restaurants. What do the restaurants have to do? Put up little dividers. What do the cashiers have to do at retail stores? Put up a divider so they couldn't connect with you. We're a people of connection. 
We've got to hold on to our connections. And we've got to connect to Jesus. See, see, most of us live in a life of where we connect to the first Adam. And when I say first Adam, I mean an Adam and Eve, you know, that Adam, the first man ever made, the one God took a bunch of dirt and breathed life into it, and that Adam. We connect with that Adam, Adam real easily, do we not? Why? Because I'm a sinful man. All because of Adam and Eve, I sin every day of my life. We connect with that real easy. We, are, we always have those, those bad thoughts, those bad things that we do. We don't mean to do them sometimes. You know, I, I, don't, I don't mean to cut somebody off in traffic. I don't mean to change a lane. And it, it, if, you, if you really, really are in bad off, situation and the officer standing in your driver's side window I didn't mean to speed officer I was trying to go with traffic there was no traffic exactly I was trying to get back up with it right there's a connection with Adam that we have so easily but we lost connection to the second Adam so the second Adam is Jesus Christ. He is the Adam in which we're supposed to be more like. See, both Adams were tempted in their lives. Very well known. All the way in Genesis. Uh, even atheists know the story of Adam and Eve. And they, they hold on to that and say, well, bad things just happen. And God gets mad at people when they do bad things. Well, that might be true. God might get mad at you. But it's because he gave you a way out and you didn't take it. God might get mad at you. He, I'm pretty sure he's been mad at me a couple of times. But I'm going to tell you what. Once I finally figured out that he had a way out for me, I took it. See, the first Adam, he gave in to his temptation and was punished for it. And the second Adam stayed strong. He took the ways out that God had laid in his heart. And he's going to punish the one who tempted him. What we're going to look at in Luke chapter 4 is we're going to look at the temptation of the second Adam. We're going to look at what Jesus did, how Jesus went through his temptations. So let's read Luke 4, 1 through 13. Follow along with me. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms and all the world, in a moment of time, and the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and the glory for, those, for this will be delivered to me, and I give to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you, were, if you were the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, throw yourselves down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and 
In the hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your presence here today, Father God. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts, and open our minds, Father God. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. Lord, let them see you, your word, Father God, and your glory and presence, Lord. And I bless in the holy name we do pray. Amen. And amen. Now, Jesus had just been baptized at the time of this story here. Now, he'd been baptized by the water. The dove had come down. And God had spoke an audible voice for all to hear. Now, many, many people got baptized. Well, five people got baptized the other week. One seeing an angel. Now, can you imagine being baptized, coming up out of the water, getting dried off a little bit, and then the Holy Spirit telling you to go? Get away from everybody. Just, just, just go on. That's what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit had been, had been brought upon Jesus as he was coming out of the water. He was being baptized by the Holy Spirit while being baptized by the water. It can happen. And so as he came up, the Holy Spirit just took hold of his hand and said, all right, come on, Jesus. We've got some business to take care of. And it won't necessarily good business in my eyes because the Holy Spirit was about to tell him not to eat anything for 40 days and 40 nights. Me and Jesus have long conversations about fasting. It's a great thing to do. I know it can, it can do a lot of things. It can help a lot of people. And I don't mind fasting. But I'm going to tell you what, it's harder. But that's okay. So as Jesus was in the wilderness, he spent time preparing for what the next step was. He was preparing for the fact of being sacrificed on a cross. Well, in that preparation, I think there's something that we forget. We tend to forget when we start talking about this, this message, this story in which we see Jesus being led out into the wilderness. And that he was there being tempted for 40 days. That's what it says in verse 2. 40 days. Now we're going to look at the three that the Bible really tells us about. But you think about this. Jesus is being strengthened at a point of where his body is being weakened all the day long 40 days 40 nights and there he is he's got the devil yapping at his behind his ear and just letting them have it oh won't you do this won't you do that oh that little breadcrumb ain't gonna hurt you you go right ahead and take that little breadcrumb And this is something that really gets me. Something that hit me this morning. As I finished reading verse 2. And it said, in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had finished, when they had ended, afterwards, he was hungry. He was so strong that he didn't get hungry until after the fact. He let the spirit work in his body so much that he wasn't hungry until after the fact. We can't even get through a church service without getting hungry. We can't let the Holy Spirit work in two hours 
let alone 40 days. See, as Christians, we tend to look at the three days, the three, the three times in which Jesus is being tempted. And I dare say that these three times are after the first 40 days of temptation. So what am I telling you? You're more like Jesus than you actually think you are. How do I know this? Because even after 40 days of tempting Jesus, did the devil not getting anywhere, he said, you know what, I got one more. He said, you know what, I got another one. He said, you know what, I got another one. What am I telling you? I'm telling you, you're more like Jesus because the devil didn't give up on tempting him and he's not going to give up on you. And see, when the devil's not willing to give up on you, it means God is not going to give up on you. Be more like Jesus. Be, be like the one who did all of this, the one who had to go through all of these things. Now see, there's a lot of times in our lives, especially those who have been to church for a very long time. You know, I like to break out these Christianese sayings that we hear all the time. And this is, this is one of my favorite ones, and I've quoted it so many times, it's ridiculous. There is no temptation that you're going to go through that Jesus didn't go through. Get in line with Jesus. That's the Christian he's saying that we have. And I, I will say there is truth into that. But I have failed to hear anybody tell me how. How is Jesus' three temptations and then those he did in the 40 days, whatever they were, we don't know. It's not for us to know. But how is Jesus' three temptations going to go through all of mine? How in the world am I supposed to be like Jesus and say, Jesus did all of this stuff so I can battle all of this stuff. I'm not strong enough. That's the point. You are not strong enough. There's people out there in California and, and Florida right now probably bench pressing 500 pounds on the beach. And they're still not strong enough. So if they were strong enough, they wouldn't be picking up 500 pounds right now. They'd be in the church picking up their arms saying, praise you, Lord. This morning, what I want us to look at is the three temptations that Jesus went through, and I want them to connect to our lives so we can be connected to his life. See, everything that you might go through, that you've already been through, that you might go through next week or even the next hour, because some of y'all are going to go out to eat in a little while, and there's going to be some loud, rowdy people in the restaurant with you. Or they're going to have some youngin' in there crying and screaming and saying, Mama, Mama! And you're going to be sitting there saying, Lord, I just want to eat in peace. The pastor has preached too long today, and I just need to eat and then go home and take me a nap. I, I just need you to hush that. That's going to be your praying, right? Let's connect everything that we're going to be going through in the rest of our lives to these three temptations. Let's make a connection between us and God. Let's make those three things that God, that Jesus went through after being tempted for 40 days, after fasting for 40 days, after officially saying he was hungry, let's go to those three temptations. The first one is found in verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Hello, he just said he was hungry. But see, this temptation is not about food. It's about instant gratification. Instant gratification. 
Satan thought he had Jesus on the ropes because he was hungry. He said, hey, if you just take this stone right here, make it some bread, you can pig out and enjoy every bit of it. If it was me standing there and the devil was tempting me, he would be like, hey, turn this stone into some, some barbecue, throw some vinegar sauce on it, and let's eat. That's what he would have said. But he was getting Jesus to a point of saying, you know what, hey, take the stone and make it bread. And see, later on in a few chapters later, you could probably read it a little bit. Matter of fact, we talk about it every first Sunday. What's the significance of bread? It's Jesus' body. He said, turn this stone into yourself. Turn this stone into something that's going to give you life. See, he wanted him to give himself instant gratification so that he could tell God that I got this. If Jesus would have given into the temptation, he would have been he would have been trusting in himself and not the Father and acting completely independent of the Father's will. If he would have just turned the stone into some bread, just doing that, not even the fact of eating, he would have been like, hey, God, I got my own will, I got my own thing. How many of us went, have been somewhere and said, you know what? I really want this. I really want, I really want this. You know, I want this new shirt. I want these new shoes. I want this new guitar. You know what? I, I want this shiny piece for my, my, my car because it'll shine a little bit more. That's instant gratification if you go out and buy it knowing that you've got to come back to the church house and pay tithes. I'm stepping on some toes here. He would also have been standing in his pride instead of obedience. You think about when you make things happen on your own, when you say, you know what, I'm going to go out and do this. This is, I did this. I made myself this way. I give myself all, all glory and all honor. I did this. I did this. When you do that, you're standing in your pride and not the obedience of the Father. So there's so many times we have walked in instant gratification. So many times that we've walked in what we want to do and not what God wants us to do. Think about all those times in which I've had um, kids, teenagers in my vehicle driving them place to place, whether it's um, Aiden and her friends or we went on a trip and I, all the boys rode with me or whatever. Because everybody wanted to ride in my car because I would play Christian rap music and it would thump really hard. That's what they enjoyed, so I played it a lot with them. But as I'm driving there, the only thing that I'm thinking half the time is when can I stop and get me a Die Mountain Dew? And I have to stop myself sometimes because I will go into a store and grab me a Diet Mountain Dew and care less about what's going on with people inside of my truck. <laughs> I've done it with my own wife. So that's instant gratification. Worrying about myself and not others. When you decide to go out of the parking lot today and if you cut somebody off or you forget to put a, put a turn signal on, and I'm talking to myself just as bad, I promise you that's why I bring up this thing because I'm a horrible driver, all right? I can drive very well. It's just I don't like using turn signals. That, that little clicker thing just does not work for me. I mean, I, I learned, Brother Bernie, you could probably agree with this one. Some of y'all probably could too. I learned how to drive in the middle of a, cotton field myself, a field. 
I, I used a field to learn how to drive. Do you think I needed a turn signal to, to drive in a field? No, I did not. So I, I blame my parents. No, actually, I don't blame parents on that. No, it's just, that's just me. I didn't ever pick it up. But when, I, when, you, when you do things like that and you turn, and you're not thinking about anybody else but yourself. It's instant gratification. It's that thing that, that holds on to you and say, you know what, I'm going to worry about myself and myself only. No. See, that temptation is all about what Jesus went through. All those little things where you worried about yourself and not anybody else. Yesterday, we were blessed during praise, and team, practice, praise team practice. We were blessed. Uh, somebody walked in off the streets and needed some help. A true person needing some help. A, a genuine person in need of help. And it wasn't instant gratification by anybody's heart that was there. It was none there. It was, here you go. Go take care of the things you need to take care of. This person walked in and they needed gas money and money for some baby formula. And the baby was in the vehicle outside. So what was the first thing we did? We gave them money. I, and I can say that I don't have access to the church's money, so therefore it came out of pocket from those who were here. There was no instant gratification. There was a connection. And we made a connection. I made a connection with this man and his wife, and, I, and they said they would be here next Sunday, and guess what? I truly believe with my whole heart that he will be here. And when he walks in, I'm going to say, how you doing? Is everything Okay. Because that's what we're here to do. We're here to be more like Jesus. We're not here to be, we're not here to be just the Christian that walks in the door. We're here to be more like Jesus. When I say here, I mean the world. We are here on this earth for a reason. I can't tell you your reason. Kelly's grandma, before she passed away, after being here for 99 years, seeing others pass away, other family members pass away, she was the oldest living relative of her family. As a matter of fact, there is a, there is a preacher of the PFWB that is her family member. They are first cousins. And every time I saw him, whether it was camp meeting or anywhere else, because he lived in the Goldsboro area, he would say, hey, how's Miss Mabel doing? And I'd say, she's doing fine. She's just still trying to figure out why she's still here. That's the only thing she would ever ask me. She would say, Josh, why is the Lord still having me here? I don't know. You've got a work to do. She said, well, I'm stuck in this, this, this room right here. I said, well, evidently somebody's going to walk into a room for you. That's the thing. We all have a purpose to be here on this earth. We can't be looking for instant gratification, buying everything we want to buy right then and there. Because there's somebody else that you need to help out. If you understand everything I just said, say amen. All right. I will end with this one little... This one little sentence, that's a good sentence, that's why I want to end with it. We are not made to be self-sufficient, but God-sufficient. That's, that's so good, you can write that one down, and you can put it on Facebook, you can put it on Instagram, you can put it on Twitter. If I would have been smart enough, I would have put it up there on the screen, but I won't smart enough. Let's look at this second temptation that, God went, that Jesus went through. And this is a big one for us, especially us men. All right. The women are fighting for it right now. The women, the women want it right now, but the men, the men fight with this every day. You look at verse 6 and verse 7. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and the glory, for this, was, this has been delivered to me, and I give to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. He was tempted with power. The devil said, hey, I'm going to give you power over all of this stuff that you just saw. I mean, he gave him a glimpse in moment of time. And um, he said, here you go. You know, the life of people's lives flashed before Jesus' eyes. And he said, I'll give you all of this if you'll just worship me. If you'll bow down to me. 
I, I find it kind of funny. It's, it's like Satan, you know, many times, many times for us men, we have that duh moment, right? That's what Satan just had. He flashed the world in front of the eyes of Jesus, who's been there from the beginning, who was, who was friends with, with Satan before he got thrown out of heaven. And he said, hey, I'll give you the power over everything that I'm going to get power for. Satan, realize what you just said. You're going to try to give power to somebody who already has power. Who had so much power, he threw you out of heaven. He had totally forgot who Jesus was. And he said, just worship me. Just do things that you say that people need to do to God. Just do them to me. And I'll give you power over all these people who are going to make fun of you. All these people who are going to shun you. All these people who are going to stab you in the back, even though they called themselves your followers. All those people you call friends. Has anybody ever had that temptation of power over their friends? There's so many people out there in this world today who have trying to get power over their friends. They say, oh, I'm going to be the next supervisor. You're going to have to answer to me. Or, oh, I've got the best car and the best house, so y'all are going to have to ask me if y'all can come over here and do this. That's power over your friends. And even more, Satan wanted Jesus to compromise himself. There's too many of us in this world today that live on compromises. I'm not compromising anymore. I'm fighting for what I believe in. I'm fighting for God. I'm fighting for this country to be the God-fearing country it once was. See, Jesus, uh, Satan wanted Jesus to compromise himself in his standards and his behaviors. He wanted him to change the way he was going to be. Think about how many people, and it, I'm going to go back to my experience. But when you get a job, there's certain standards that you have to follow. A lot of those standards come out with dress codes. You have to follow a dress code. You've got to wear this. As y'all get to know me, as my wife can attest to, I don't like doing things in the normal facet. I am a, if you tell me that it needs to be done this way, I'm going to figure out a way to do it this way. If you tell me I'm, supposed to, I'm not supposed to wear shorts, I'm going to wear shorts. You can ask the praise team. When we have praise team practice, there's nothing for me to walk in here with Crocs and a hat on. It's not because I don't, sir, I don't think that hats should be worn in church or not worn in church. Look, I come to praise the Lord. The Lord don't care what I got on. But see, Satan wanted Jesus just to say, you know what, hey, change all your behaviors. Say, hey, you know what, that God thing I was doing, you know, 45 days ago, it's not a real thing. You know, you need to worship this guy right here. You need to do this thing. You need to do what he says, and you'll get everything you want. He also wanted him to change his loyalty and his faithfulness to God. When changing standards, when changing your behaviors, you're going from saying, you know what, I'm the biggest fan of this person over here, but now I'm, I'm the biggest fan of this person. You know, if we were talking about sports teams, you'd be saying, oh, I'm the biggest fan of the Carolina Panthers. And Carolina Panthers don't make it to the playoffs. And you go over here, I'm the biggest fan of the New England Patriots. As long as Tom Brady's on the team, I'm a fan of that team. Right? That's what he was trying to get Satan to do, or Jesus to do. To say, you know what, I'm no longer part of this team, I'm part of this team. I'm going to get this over here. See, and the biggest thing, 
that Satan was trying to get him to do, the biggest thing that Satan's trying to get you to do right now is to change your mission and your ministry. When temptations come, he's trying to tempt you away from your mission and your ministry. You have a mission, you have a ministry. It might not be standing up here long-winded as I am and singing and praising and then preaching and then preaching and preaching and preaching some more. And See, that's the thing. You've got a ministry. You've got a mission on this earth. I'm here to hopefully teach you a little bit to lift you up so you can go out and do things for the Lord that's what I'm here for I'm here to make sure that the things of the church are the way God expected them to be and then you're here to learn to go out the doors to touch people's lives So when, Jesus, when the devil tempts you, and when you get tempted, because let's be honest, it ain't all the devil's fault. We, we get tempted by ourselves. Just remember, it's not wrong to have power, but it's wrong to get it in certain ways. There's nothing wrong as a, as a little kid on up to say, I want to be the president of the United States of America. But if you're going to give up everything that you believe in, everything that you were taught to get there, then you know, used to be in the president of the United States of America. If you're willing to give up all your morals, all your beliefs, and your work ethic, you're going to be proving nothing to this world. This world already knows that if you lie, cheat, and steal to get to the top, you've done it the way that the world expected it to do. But when you do it, when you do it, the fact of you, you stand on everything you believe in, when you, when you say, you know what, no, God said that the baby was a baby when it was, when it was conceived. That's that's when a baby is a baby. When you stand up and you say, no, I believe in the words of Jesus Christ. And no, I, I do not believe that man was made to be a, man was not made to be a girl and a girl was not made to be a man. God made him right the first time. I believe that. When you're willing to stand up and say that, and you slowly get there, you finally start proving to everybody that childhood story of the tortoise and the hare. That Jesus, doing the way that God had planned in doing it, the way that Jesus has taught us to do it, slow and steady does win the race. What I want you to understand this morning here in this church is that no, not next week, not next month, but we have 300 people in this church. But slow and steady, we'll win the race. This church will be built back up. This church will have a full capacity. Because we're going to do it God's way. We're going to start with the foundation and stand on it. We're going to be a part of what God has planted us to be. And we're going to make sure all of our materials are set right first. See, there's one thing that we need to make sure we're worshiping when we worship. It's the one who owns the cows on a thousand hills, not just the hill. Not just the hill, but the one who owns everything on top of the hills. Satan is the prince of the earth. Satan does have a lot of power on this earth. He will own a lot of things on this earth for a little while. But get it right, for a little while. He's going to be locked up. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire, church. <laughs> power, the power he thinks he has now ain't nothing compared to the power of Jesus Christ. 
Hello, if you look in the back of the book, if you look in Revelation, if you've never read Revelation, read it a couple of times because it's going to take at least two to understand three words. But if you look at it, he's the only one who has power to break open the seal to the scroll. He's the only one that has the power to take and rip that seal off and start the whole rapture thing. Calling up the children. It's him and him alone. The third temptation that, the, that Satan had the, had the audacity to take upon Jesus. I mean, let me be real for a second. If, he's, if, if Satan's willing to do this on earth, and, and he knows where he stands in God's eyes, can y'all just imagine what he did while they were in heaven? I mean, it's just, it's kind of funny. It's like watching a little kid and say, if you have the audacity to do that in front of me, what do you do when I'm not here? You, that kind of thing. But this third temptation, something we all deal with. Oh, man, we deal with it really bad. And I promise you I will be finishing up here shortly. But this is something we all deal with, and I mentioned it the other day when I started talking about masks. But verse 9 through 11 then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. See, this is a temptation strictly of identity. He's trying to get Jesus. Now, this is not the first time that he's told Jesus, hey, if you're the son of God. But no, this is strictly all about identity and making sure he knows who he is or question who he is. Satan wants you to question who you are. And that's when you get to come back and say, I am a child of God. See, Satan was trying to get him to question all the things that were going on. He was trying to get him to question his identity and suffer for the namesake of who he thought he was. Satan wanted Jesus to throw himself off at the top of the temple just to see if God would do what God said he would do. If you truly are who you are, God will do this for you. If you truly are who you are, God's going to make sure that bill's paid. No? If you truly are who you say you are and you study, you're going to pass that test. See, that's not always God's will. It's not always God's plan. I can't tell people why people die. I don't know God's plan. When my grandfather died two months after I graduated high school, I couldn't tell you why he died. I know how he died, but why he died, I don't know. He was a perfectly healthy man. He had some lung cancer back in the day and he had some issues with his lungs, but there was never a second where I would have told you, hey, before I start my first college class, my grandfather's going to die. I mean, I, I literally walked where I drove from my college campus to the hospital in which where he was there with my books on my, in my hands and on my book bag and watched him die. I can't tell you why he died, but I can tell you one thing. God gave him insight of what's, what was about to happen. So the day I walked across the stage, it was either June 5th or June 6th, something like that. I walked across the stage and my mom said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go camping and fishing. That's all I want to do. 
And she said, okay. I said, oh, and yes, I want to shave my head completely bald and spend a week out at the beach fishing. Wrong, wrong thing for me to do. I come back blisters, but anyway. When I got to my grandfather and I gave him a hug, he told me, he said, Josh, this will be the last graduation I see. And that's something that stuck with me since 2002. That's something that stuck with me because God gave him insight of what was going to happen because he was so close with God. I didn't have to see my grandfather read the Bible every day. I saw him live it out. I mean, hello. He had one kid in, in jail and the other one moved from three and a half hours away to live with him. And oh, by the way, that kid's bringing her husband and her, and, and her child. And they're bringing a 1,200 square foot house materials all the way with them. I mean, when I, was, when I first moved into my grandparents' house, I looked like Princess in the Pea. I'm not lying, I had 20 mattresses in my room. I didn't have a bed frame. I, I literally had mattresses upon mattresses. Because that's, that's, we had to put it somewhere. And little old Snow Hill didn't have no storage containers then. They didn't have nothing to put nothing in. But it was nothing for us to go over to my grand. Uh, my grandparents had some kind of cabinetry in an in a area of the house. I don't know why it was there. The little area had been converted from a bedroom to part of the living room, back to a bedroom, back to the living room. It was really weird. But in there was a hymnal. And I was able to grab that hymnal anytime I wanted to. And boy, oh boy, could I sound like a, a mess when I was singing. I'm not even going to go how far bad it was. But I could sit there and I could sing or attempt to sing. And my grandfather would just sit there and listen. He lived it out. He lived a Christian life. He lived out to be more like Jesus than anybody else. What I'm telling you this morning is that your identity is found in Christ. It's not found in anybody else on this earth. It ain't about how much money you make. It ain't about how much money you were able to give last year. It ain't about what kind of car you drive. Your identity is found in what God gave you. And that was Jesus Christ. And there's going to be people out there, just like Satan did to Jesus, that they're going to try to use biblical words to twist everything to make you think differently. Read the Bible yourself. Even here today, read the Bible yourself. Go home and read this, this message, these verses once again, and, and let God speak into your life. Don't just let it be, Josh. Your identity is not found in what I can tell you, what I can give you. I had people who prophesied over me, prophesied over me when I was trying to figure out what I was supposed to be doing in my life. And they said, make your calling your own. And I looked at them and I said, tell me what that means. They said, make the calling your own. I said, tell me what the calling is. Because I was literally going from a pharmacy technician to trying to figure out how I could go back to school to become a pharmacist, to baking cakes and decorating cakes and building stuff so I could bake the cakes and decorate the cakes without having to do it in my house. Because legally I couldn't do it in my house because I had a dog that shed and the dog can't be in there to have a home bakery so I needed to build something. So I went and built it seven minutes from my house, and then we ended up turning that into a chicken coop back at the house, so we had to go pick it up and take it back to the home place to make it a chicken coop. 
God will turn everything upside down if you're not willing to do it in His will. We are more like Jesus than we actually could ever think of. See, Jesus had to suffer these great temptations, suffer through 40 days of not eating, and then go through these things. He had to deny who he was and the power he had for the greater good. I mean, do you think, do you think Jesus had to go through this? Do you think Jesus wanted to go through this? No, he didn't. You know why I know that? Because later on, he goes and starts in praying, and he says, if this can be taken from me, take it. Do you think Jesus wanted to go through 40 days of not eating? No. He didn't want to go through listening to that old Lucifer, taking him everywhere and letting him lead him everywhere. So he bowed down to God's authority and was obedient to God and had planned and just watched his plans unfold. And see, if you go into just another verse, just one more verse, you can see that it says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. See, Jesus did all of this stuff, gave up all of this power that he had to let the devil do what he had to do because it was God's plan. And what does it tell us? He didn't return in his power. He returned in the Holy Spirit power to the people of Galilee. It wasn't by his might. It was by his might. It's not by your power and your might that you're going to get through the temptations it's through his be more like jesus you have it in you see the first adam was made in the image of god but the second adam was god with us you're connected to god with us you're, you're connected to the man who walked around as God. Yeah, our great, 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 and keep on saying greats. Grandfather was Adam, yes. But before you can get to him, before you get to him saying all those greats, you can get to the great man named Jesus. You're connected to him. You know, all those begats and begots and gave way to him. All those things in the Bible that tell you the whole lineage of everybody. Here's the thing. You're connected to each and every one of those people. You are connected to the man who came out of the lineage of David. You are the man. You are connected to the second Adam, the one who said, I am the way that you're supposed to be. You're more like Jesus than you can ever think of. This morning, I just want to make sure you understand. You're more like Jesus, and you can act more like Jesus, and you can do more like Jesus, and you can live more like Jesus. If you're willing just to let the other stuff ride. Let it all go. Be more like Jesus this morning. Connect to Jesus each and every day. Connect to those things that, that tell you what's going on in life. Let God lead your heart. Don't let your head lead your heart. If my head led my heart, we would have been out of here 45 minutes ago. Uh, I'm being truthfully honest with you. This morning, I just want to make sure you're connected with God, whether you've been saved or you're not saved or whether you've been saved for 95 years, 96 years, 97 years. I just want to make sure you're connected with God this morning because when you're connected with God, the things that happen during our praise and worship time, during our prayer time, that's what happens on a daily basis.
Start walking around saying I'm more like Jesus than Satan gives me credit for and see what happens. I'm more like Jesus. See, I can give more like Jesus. I can serve more like Jesus. This morning, as we pray, I just want you to just think about what you can do to be more like Jesus. What can you do to, to be connected to the second Adam more than the first? The second Adam is the one who gives us the example. It's not the copy of the example. The second Adam is the one who gives us the the question and the answer, not just the question. I mean, when I was in school, if I could get a, a copy of the test, I was happy as I'll get out. But what Jesus is telling you, what God is telling you, I gave you the questions to the test and the answer to the test. But so many of us have forgotten to grab the answers to the test and just kept on going, thinking we could get through this life on our own. And you can't. So as we all bow our heads, close our eyes, I do want to extend the invitation of you connecting with Jesus, with God through Jesus Christ. I want you to be saved. I want you to enjoy what God has put, uh, put together in heaven for you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to right now, all I'm asking you to do is walk up here and pray with me. Just walk up here and pray with me. If you're on YouTube and you're watching this, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you announce that he is your King of Kings and your Lord of Lords, reach out to us. Just tell Jesus that you accept him as, as every part of your life and not just a little bit. Heavenly Father, God, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give you praise, honor, and glory, Father. Lord, I'm gonna also ask you to make me more like Jesus. Make everyone in here more like Jesus. As we stand here, Lord, with as as a body, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and I know we can be more than what we are. Father God, I just ask you right now, Lord, let us stand on that fact that we are more like Jesus than what we think. When temptation comes, Father God, let us just just bypass temptation, Father God. Let it not be a part of our lives anymore, Father God. Lord, let us give us strength to give us the words that it needs, Lord, to get us through and to rebuke it, Father God. Lord, I thank you right now for this service today, Father God. We're going to give you praise, honor, and glory for deserve it all, Father God. I thank you right now, Lord, for those who are accepting you as their Lord and Savior and getting saved, Father God, and accepting salvation from you so they can be connected to y'all, to, to God, to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus. We want them connected to you, Lord. Father God, I just thank you right now, Lord. We give it all to you, Lord. It's not blessed in the holy name we do pray. Amen. And amen. Brother Bernie, will you pray a dismissal prayer, please?